Why isn't it working? Hello, welcome to Amos Eden Fee Bible Study. And in this lesson, we're going to discuss the letter I for the word in. In this lesson, if you find it, find it to be helpful at the end and enjoyed it, please like us and share with a friend and family member. And if you would, add a comment. We would love to hear from you. Also, if you'd like to be notified of when the next videos are available, hit the subscribe button. You'll be glad you did. The word in is such a little word, like the word go that we did a few lessons ago for the letter G. It is small, it is only two letters of the alphabet, but yet it has such a powerful meaning when, with, when it's fully understood. But typically we see a word like in and we just take it for granted. We just overlook it and race forward and don't even slow down to fully take in the implications of what it really means. So what does the word in mean? According to Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, the word in is a primary preposition donating fixed position, any place, time, or state. In Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary of the American Language, it says in is present or enclosed, surrounded by limits, as in a house, in a fort, in a city. So how can we actually describe what that, those definitions are meaning? Some of you may already have a full understanding and grasp exactly the direction I'm going. Let's just say I'm getting ready to drive my pickup truck. I can't stand in the front of the bumper and drive the vehicle. I can't stand on the back bumper and, and drive the vehicle. I'm not able to get, even get in the bed of the truck and expect to be able to drive the truck. I have to be in the front seat, in the driver's seat, seat belt fastened, feet on the brake pedal and the gas pedal, key in the ignition, hands on the steering wheel, in order to properly be able to drive the vehicle. That's the only method there is. I have to be in the vehicle. I am within con the constraints of what the definition talks about. Going back to Noah Webster's, surrounded by limits. I'm surrounded by the confines of the front seat of the truck in, in the cab. Just like anybody with any, any vehicle, you're, you're, you're in the, the limitations of the vehicle in order to be able to properly drive it, no matter what kind it is. So how does it apply to us in our Christian life? Let's go to Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Normally we use the first part of this passage, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God, to lead someone to Christ, and rightly so. It's a great passage for that. But this was actually written to Romans who were Christians and basically explaining and reiterating something they should already know being justified freely by God's grace that is through God's grace that we actually have accept or that we have the opportunity of salvation through the Son of Jesus Christ who's who's our redemption whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. And going back to the redemption part, redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, going back to our definition, there are limitations to redemption. It is only through Christ Jesus. And then the other constraint of the limitations of what we're talking about of being in is his blood. It can be done no other way. As another passage of scripture in James talks about, if you believe in God, you do well. But even the demons and Satan believe there's a God. But as Christians, we should be in Christ, which is different. It's more than just believing. It is actually being part of. 
Let's go to the next passage. 1 John chapter 3, verses 23 through 24. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment, that he that keepeth his commandment dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us, by the Spirit which he hath given us. What we find here is the commandment of God, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. And the other part of that, even Jesus talked about, about that, talked about the greatest commandments, the first being to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and mind and soul. The second is like unto the first, love thy neighbor as thyself. So we actually find that echoed here in this passage of Scripture. And that's the commandments he gave us. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him. And he in, he in him. Basically exchanging the in part in that if we obey Christ's commandments, we are demonstrating we are in Christ. Because he is the example that we are following. And in so doing, we have the knowledge that he is dwelling in us. He is in, in us, not outside of us. And hereby we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit which he hath given us. The Holy Spirit dwells within us as Christians. We have the, the indwelling of Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit guiding us to do what is right according to his word. He gives us commandment, and that gives us the power to follow those commandments. The Holy Spirit, he guides us and leads us to do what is right in his eyes. All we have to do is be in Christ and be obedient. Romans 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So this kind of echoes what we just talked about. We can walk after the flesh, but that's a demonstration that we are not in Christ. On the other hand, if we are not in the flesh, but we are obedient to Christ, there's no condemnation that can be brought upon us because of the fact that we are being obedient to Jesus Christ, indicating that we are in him and he is in us. And there again, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we can be successful in these things, being in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Another example of being in. It's a huge promise. Paul's writing to the Romans, I am persuaded that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Why? Because we are in Christ Jesus our Lord. And there again, that demonstration is illuminated by our obedience to Jesus Christ and following his commandments, following the guidance of the Holy Spirit, being obedient to Christ. That demonstrates that we are in Christ. And we have these promises. There is nothing that can separate us. I'm not saying that we can lose our salvation here. What I'm talking about is our relationship. Our relationship with Jesus Christ being saved is we are a child of God. But the, I can't even think of the word for it right now. But the other part of that is being with each other, being in communication, being in proper fellowship. There we go, there's the word. Being in proper fellowship with our Lord, Jesus Christ, and with God the Father. That can only be accomplished, provided we are in Christ. We can't lose the relationship of salvation, but we can lose the fellowship if we're not careful. And we don't want that to happen. We want to maintain the relationship and the fellowship in such a way for the closeness that we'll have with God the Father and with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be joyful and glad and be communicating with God our actions and what we're doing and being 
able to lead us in the right way, being obedient, helping us to do what is right, helping us to take the next step in our Christian lives. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Paul is writing to the Philippians. A lot of people, even in today's time, they look to Paul as thinking, man, he, is, he has arrived. But Paul is saying here in this passage of Scripture, he hasn't arrived at all. He has not conquered. He has not achieved. He has not come to his final end. He has not apprehended. He's still in the process of all those things throughout his entire earthly life. And one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. That's a key, key part of this passage of Scripture. We can fail in this very moment. I could fail in this video. But the very next moment after this, we see that we have an opportunity to be successful. As Paul says, reaching forth unto those things which are before. So should we, pressing to the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And there's a word again, in Christ Jesus. And what's in Christ Jesus? He's taught us everything we need to do. He's gave, set us an example of how we're supposed to live, talk, and act toward other people, and treat other people. Those are so critically important to us, being in Christ. All this stuff pulls together in Christ. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, that's a fancy word, perfect being complete, be less minded, and if anything, be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this even unto you. So in other words, if, there, if, if you're not on track, if you're off course, if you're not fully in Christ Jesus, not fully being obedient, be otherwise like-minded, God shall reveal that unto you. Be open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and allow God to talk to us. Talk to us about our obedience. Talk to us about what he wants us to do. And then the next step is for us to just obey. John 15, verses 4 through 7. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Let's go to the very last, look at this last part of the passage one more time. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. This is talking about the kind of fellowship we can have with Christ Jesus. We can have a fellowship that we can ask what we will, and he will answer. And he will give it unto us. It shall be done. But granted, we'll probably be thinking differently. Because we'll no longer be outside of Christ. We will be in Christ. So as we look at this famous passage of Scripture, Christ begins with a parable. And a parable is talking about the vine. All over the country there's vineyards. And everyone is very familiar with them. The vine is what has the roots. It is what is rooted in the earth, which gathers all this nourishment and spreads it throughout the remainder of the plant to produce fruit. And then the branches are what actually bear the grapes for the vine. The vine provides the nutrients and everything that's needed, but then the branch is the one that actually produces the fruit. And then he rolls that over into our Christian lives, being in Christ Jesus and being obedient to him, we're going to bear fruit because he is the one that is rooted in eternity, who has given us all of our nutrients that we need, all the information we need, all the skills and all the power to be successful as the branch to bear fruit. As he told his apostles, I'm going to teach you to be fishers of men. men. We too will be fishers of men. That's the fruit we're talking about. 
it could be for passing out tracts. It be, could be physically talking to someone about Christ and leading them to Christ. It could be our example or a combination of all those things, all in the one. But that is the fruit as a Christian. And it is done through being in Christ. That's the only way it can be done. Again, that fellowship with the vine, having that connection, having that ability and having that strength and power that Christ provides us by only being in him. We can't be in front of Christ. We can't be behind Christ. We can't be above Christ. We can't be below Christ. We have to be in Christ for this to work in the method that needs to be done. So let's go back to the very beginning of this video here where we had the question, why isn't it working? Are we in Christ? Do we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us as we should? As in, we're listening to Him. He's there. He has everything that we need. He's the toolbox that we have. We have everything we need within that toolbox. We need to listen to Him, and we need to follow His guidance, because He's going to point to Christ every single time. So we can be in Christ, so he can be in us, so we can have the joy of knowing that we're bearing fruit for him. We can be successful at having the promises that no matter what, our fellowship will maintain its connectivity with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then having the promise of abiding in him, whatever we need, we can ask for it and he will give it. What a joy and a promise we have in that. Do you have all these things? Do you truly abide in Christ? Or do you still have the question, why isn't it working? Think on these things.